So, good afternoon everyone. Today I'm going to talk about something which I believe we universally think as being beneficial. And the special something is the knowledge of a second language. Now, a second language can take you so far. It's this passport that allows you to travel the world and not just be seen as another tourist, but as a member of this wider community. A second language is this tool that allows you to research into fields that would never be available in your native tongue. And overall, it's something that makes you a more lucid, cultured, and worldly person. Even though there are all these benefits to learning a language, sometimes we cannot read them. And if some of you don't really know where I'm coming from, I would like you to tell my own personal story when learning languages. When I got into a new school in fifth grade, I learned that I would be having German classes. And I had always been crazy about German. I thought it was a beautiful language, it was very complex, it sounded so cool, and I wanted to be a good German speaker and writer so bad. And by the end of my fifth grade, I had made some progress. I was happy with it. Unfortunately, I started noticing this pattern. And I didn't like this pattern at all. Every year in September, after the summer, I had forgotten everything I had learned. But even worse, in June, by the end of the school year, I was exactly at the same level that I was the year before. And I just simply thought, well, I can't do this. I put so much effort into learning German. I've memorized verb lists. I've memorized vocabulary and everything that the teacher, the teacher said. And still, I'm stuck in the same place. Why can't I develop in this language? And by the time I was in eighth grade, I had English and German classes. I didn't speak either of those languages well, and the only one that I thought I was good at, that I could communicate with reliability, was Portuguese. And at that stage I just thought, well, I'm not getting any younger. I know it's very young to be saying that, but I no longer had that capability, that innate capability that children have to just pick up on sounds, replicate them, and in a matter of months, you're a native speaker. So if I wanted to learn languages like Chinese, Russian, Tamil, all these languages which require this talent, well, I couldn't. It was out the window. I would be monolingual for the rest of my life. But let's fast forward two years, and I'm in 10th grade, I'm getting into this new school, and by then I had a completely different status in language. I spoke two languages natively or at a near native level. I could speak two languages fluently and two languages at a conversational level. And during these two years, I didn't necessarily follow the advice that my teachers gave me. It had taken me nowhere. Memorizing grammar and words wasn't the most helpful tool. I didn't enroll myself in any fancy courses. I didn't buy any university approved textbooks. And today, I would like you to, I would like to share with you what exactly happened during these two years that so radically changed my experience in language. And what happened here was that I didn't follow convention. I redefined my own vision of language. And this started by doing some research on this very special group of people which are called polyglots. If you haven't heard of them, they are people who can speak four or more languages fluently. And one of the polyglots which inspired me the most was Tim Donor. He was 17 at the time, the first time I saw his video, and I wasn't much younger than him. And he spoke 20 languages. I was like, how can he do that? What is wrong with me? Why can't I be as good as he is? And I came to this realization that, every, that the things I was going to learn in a language were not the best they were a bit wrong. And I started looking into how these polyglots look into language, what they do exactly to learn them so fast. And based on their ideas, and my own ideas, and really finding what makes me comfortable, what is appropriate for my own situation, I created this roadmap that can be used to take over any language, any language that you want to learn. I would like to start this journey, like any great journey, by acknowledging our mistakes by like starting with the biggest mistake we make in languages, and that is we learn how to read them before we learn how to speak them. And that makes sense. We are young adults. Most of our reliable information, the sources that we want to cite, are written sources. Books, newspapers, etc. So if I want to be cultured, if I ever want to know things in the second language that are specific to that language, I have to know how to read and write. But let's think about when you were a child, or perhaps think about the language you speak best. I assume your native language. 
You learn this language not by listening to your parents, by replicating what they said, and eventually you start to speak it. And by the time you got into grade school and then the time I actually started reading and writing, you were already fluent. You were not eloquent, but you could speak and express yourself. So why should we make foreign languages different? And I'd like to give you an example of how learning how to pronounce things is really half the battle. And if you try to understand every single word, what every single letter means, you can truly antagonize your whole experience in this beautiful journey. This is Russian. It was the most difficult language for me so far. I started studying in, November, in December, and I was very interested about Russian because they used to rolling and not the Latin alphabet. It would be the first language that I would be studying that doesn't use the same alphabet as mine. And I spent a whole weekend trying to understand Cyrillic. I memorized each of the letters, and e after a few days, I could even say single out words. And I felt really accomplished. Whoa, well, I can read Cyrillic. But whenever I would look at something like this, a whole bunch of words together, I could tell two things. I know that this is Cyrillic, and I know that I don't know what in the world is going on. This was gibberish to me. So what should I do? Do I just quit? No. I'm going to think like a child. What would a child do? So I went onto YouTube and I started listening to native speakers pronouncing the sentence. And as they pronounced them, I wrote down the way they said things. Where should I stress the phrase? Where should I go faster? What are the really important words that I must know how to pronounce if I want to be, may make myself clear? And my first step in language, in this language, was necessarily reading that, but this one. There are any Russians in the room, I apologize. I've only started studying this for a few months, and my pronunciation isn't there yet. But I actually said some Russian sounds. This was my first attempt at speaking Russian, at replicating these sounds that are completely different from my own language. And here I'd like to start stressing the importance of sounds and learning how to listen. Languages, in, its essence, in their essence, are basically phonemes together that form words, and these words form sentences, and then on, you're capable of expressing yourself. So if you ever want to go anywhere in the language, you have to know what are these building blocks, these sounds that are so characteristic and so important, that will basically allow you to express yourself naturally. And this ties in with a very important part of any language course, if you, and that is learning words. You want to be eloquent, you want to have specific terms that will apply to every situation you find yourself in. And as young adults, we don't want to appear slightly stupid for not knowing the precise term for things. But in a new language, the way we tend to find these words is usually the wrong one. We tend to find things based on their translation. For instance, if I was learning places in town in Dutch, I could think of a zoo, Dierentown, a pharmacy, apotheca, or a school, a school. They are all physical places in a city, but there is no real connection between these words when I say them. The connection between them is not intuitive. So if I'm in the heat of the moment and I have to remind myself of a very particular word, I will actually have to make an effort to know that word. It will not come out easily. So what can I do to fix this? What can I do to make language appear natural? Well, I have to go native. Instead of thinking in my own language, I have to adapt, and I have to start thinking in Dutch. I have to look at these sounds that are so typical, and these sounds that are really the building blocks of the language, and I'm going to start grouping the words based on their sounds. I have two tables over here, one of words derived by common, and others of, of words with the sound A. Common, uncommon, the common, the common. Leben, Kreben, Kreisen, Schreiben. They all have different meanings. They're not logically related in terms of their English translation, but they sound very similar. Whenever I think of common, I think of the common and uncommon. There is a word chain that I've created simply from listening to these words. And if I'm truly to seek out these most more elemental sounds in the language, I'm going to find terms that are applicable to everything. These words are all over. They can be applicable to every situation because as I said, they are the characteristic sounds of a language. Native speakers use them all the time. So if I memorize words like this, at a certain stage, I can, my, I can find myself in any situation and be able to express myself. I will not be the most eloquent person. I will not know the specific term for a specific thing that I want to say.
But if I find myself in a situation I've never imagined to be in, I will at least be able to communicate. Might not be the, most, the better way, but I can express myself. And here, I've achieved one of the biggest goals in the language. Making your, making your ideas across in the most simple and natural way, way possible. But you may still be thinking, how will I memorize these words? I probably don't live in the country of the language that I want to learn. How will I pick upon these sounds if I don't really have the opportunity? And even if I, I have this opportunity, I still have to memorize them. Like, I memorize a list based on translations. Here I'd like to present the works of a German statistician from the 19th century Ebbinghaus. And he studied how people memorize syllables and fun trivia. And he tried to find how long it took for these people to forget the, this information. And according to his studies, if you never revise something, it'll take you around six days to forget almost every day. If you revise it once, you're around at 20%. Third, 60%. Third revision, you're around at 90%. Now, this is no news for us. We're high schoolers. Our teachers have put a lot of emphasis on revising things to know things for tests and exams. But there is a part of Ebbinghaus' work that is not so obvious. And what he said is that after this first stage where we, where we have this stronger interaction with the new content, we should not stop revising it, we should continue. And as we, as we continue and as we make more revisions, the more spaced out these revisions become. And by a certain stage, these words will be natural to us. We will, insta inst we will instantaneously come up with them. And how this is specifically related to language. Well, I want to give you my example of when I was learning English. In eighth grade, I set out this goal to learn as many words in English as I learned Portuguese. And the way I found to do this was simply by watching TV in English. I watched the news, I watched movies, I started reading every Miss Marple and Sherlock Holmes I could find in English. And as I read through these books and as I listened through these broadcasts, I started writing down words. I got this diary and I wrote, that, I wrote down the terms I liked, terms I didn't know. I wrote that way they were said. And every week, I would go over this list. I would highlight the most important words, the ones that I said, whoa, I really have to know this. This is really important. And every month, I would go over these highlighted terms again. And by the end of the year, I had compiled a list of 4,000 words. Now, I didn't know the 4,000 words, not even close, but I was confident about my own English knowledge. By then, I could confidently say that I was a good speaker. I could express myself. And during this process, I was following Ebbinghaus. I was making spaced out provisions progressively longer in terms of the interval between them, and by the end of the year, these words that were foreign to me were now natural, naturally incorporated in my own mental depot. But you may be thinking, one of the biggest parts of my, of my process of learning English, in learning English was based on reading. And so far, I have been very liberal about not learning grammar or learning how to read. And how will I go about this? Some languages have completely different alphabets compared to ours. They have a completely different grammar. The syntax is all messed up. How will I learn this? Well, you just have to keep one thing in mind. You are learning a second language. You're not reading your first language. So when you're going to get a book to read, you should not really be looking at the plot or what is being said. You should be more looking at the syntax, at the new words you find. But you should be asking, how will I find a book I can read in this language? You're not going to read War and Peace in Russian after a year of studying, the, after a month of studying the language. I've done that, and that is not a very comfortable place to be in. So, you're not going to get one of those simplified second language books either, because the content is oversimplified. It's simply not appealing to us anymore. Those books are made for a younger audience. I'm going to find something that I know for sure I will understand barely, and something that is interesting to me. I can read the news, or in, case for, or in this case for German, I started reading short stories. I was always very passionate about Germany. I always wanted to know more about German literature, and this was the perfect way to know more about it. And as I read through these short stories, I wasn't really concerned about what, what was happening with each of the characters. I knew what was happening generally, but I didn't really know the details, because I was reading in a second language. And as I read through, I would, come, I would find new words, like Bekonen, 
I would highlight the word. I would look up the translation, actually meant to justify, to reason. And then I read a little bit more, and I'd find Bagwoman again. And I was like, to reason, now I know this word. But then I would find other terms like das. Das means that, which is a word I knew, but I never realized that whenever you use das, the verb has to come at the end, va, to be. And then I would find verbs and special tenses, like aufstehen, you, put, you have to break up the verb. But I never really realized that I just used aufstehen regularly and I was making a mistake. So what does this mean? It means that as you read through a book, after a whole year of reading a language, you'll be acquainted with these basic rules that characterize a good German writer. These rules that everyone must, must use if they want to be understood, if they want to speak correctly. And they will be naturally incorporated into my own knowledge. And now, there is a lot to take in. But what you but do I really must know to learn a second language? Well, there are four things. First of all, you have to have interest. You have to have a good reason. Your reason has to be strong enough to t that will tell yourself every day you will spend 10 to 15 minutes on this language. Consistently, you cannot quit. It has to be a passionate reason that upon any sort of setback, you will tell yourself, I can't do this, I'm not going to quit. Because if your reason is just shallow and weak, you're not going to go very far. Second and third, you have to listen and you have to practice. Think as if you were a child. You're going to listen and you're going to replicate. And in the process, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. When I was learning English, I thought that Beagle was bagel. And I went to the deli in the US and they asked for uh, Beagle with cheese, which was a very inconvenient mistake. But I made it. And I learned a new word. In the end, practice makes perfect. And if others don't like the fact to make mistakes or make fun of them, who cares? This is an investment that you make on yourself. So humiliate yourself with mistakes. Just go ahead because after making a lot of mistakes, you'll be a good speaker. And lastly, you have to create habits. The 10 minutes that you're going to spend on this new language have to be something you like, something that you find enjoyable, not just a burden you're putting on yourself. So you have to find this hobby, something that will force you to say your language, but something that will force you to say your language in a way that you like. And if you do this consistently, you can just go so far. And so to conclude, you don't have to be special. You don't have to be a freak in nature or incredibly talented. You just have to be yourself. You don't have to be young. You don't have to be old. You just have to be hardworking. And like that, you can go anywhere in life. So thank you for your attention.